Hello my friends, welcome back to a brand new episode of the podcast. This week I am talking all about Swifts, their behaviour, where they come from, what they do uh, with the local guys from Salisbury Swifts. Funny that. And uh, no, it's a really, really great conversation uh, to continue uh, my education into wildlife, but also um, I didn't touch necessarily on how to capture them because these guys are photographers, but it made sense uh, to talk more about their behaviour, more about what we can potentially do, uh, those who may be interested in uh, helping the species are long but on a hand over to the interview thank you ever so much for coming back and joining me and i'll see you very very soon okay i, I think um when i say thank you for inviting us for this podcast um so my name is daniel cronenberg and i'm the coordinator of salisbury and Wilton swifts which i'm sure we'll talk a lot about in a minute and my colleague will also say hello now that's richard yeah, hi, I'm uh, Richard Reed. I just love Swifts and Daniel's been very helpful in the past in helping me set up some uh, boxes on my house. And um, apart from anything else, I I've loved these birds for, for very many years, having actually grown up in Central Africa where they belong. Daniel will correct me on that. <laughs> Well, both of you, you know, thank you so much for the time and uh, I, I appreciate it. And for me, uh, swifts are interesting birds because, well, they're fast, right? So from obviously from a capturing point of view, that becomes interesting that I'm sure we'll get on to. But for those who maybe are not aware, I mean, we're, we are kind of alluded to it a little bit about where they come from, but they're migratory, right? So they, they, they come and go. So wh what does that mean for those who, who are maybe not aware, but... Also, where do they kind of come from and then where do they go back to? Where's that Where's that kind of, wh wh why do they do it? How do they do it, et cetera? They, that, that kind of basic, semi-basic information. But I think it's important to ground us in in that before we move any further ahead in in regards to, you know, the rest of the conversation. Yeah, well, you've, you've mentioned that they're migratory. Um, they spend the majority of their lives in Central Africa, um, a lot of the time over the Congo rainforest, but also moving around in Southern Africa, um, as far as uh, Mozambique, and some even as far as South Africa. Um, they, they live entirely in the sky. They are aerial birds. They don't land in Africa at all, unless they've been blown out the sky by some weather event or whatever, but not by choice. Um, and then they just come to uh, northern climates uh, right across Europe and even as far as Beijing in China, although that with, might be a subspecies, but um, to, to breed. They, the one thing they can't do in the sky is lay eggs and raise chicks. And they come to more northern um, uh, areas because we have longer daylight hours, particularly in the summer. And that gives them a much longer time to feed their chicks during the crucial period. And also really just following the biomass in the in the sky um, where they feed. So that's why they come to the to the UK, which is where we are and other parts of Europe. Um, and that's just for three months generally in the year to raise a family and then go straight back to Africa. OK. And what is that three month window for for people who are well, not aware? It varies. Um, in 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 uh, Israel, for instance, they they turn up in in April, and um, the the three month period would be April, May, June. Um, here in the UK, they tend to turn up around the beginning of May, and so it'd be May, June, July. Though obviously some come a little bit earlier, and some leave a little bit later, depending on. How, how their families are, you know, at what stage their, their chicks are. Um, and then in northern areas, as far as north as Finland, they arrive even later and leave even later. Okay. David, do you have anything to, to specifically say? I mean, is there like, is there stuff that people can look out for? I mean, where do we, where do we see the, 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 the Swiss specifically? Sorry, sorry it's, um, it's uh, Daniel. I think you're asking me, were you? Yeah. Sorry, my so apologies. My David apologies. I don't know why. Um, so what was the question again? I was so shocked. It was just that's just, that's all right. It was just asking where can people specifically look to see them. 
you know because obviously we yeah. uh, they are either potentially nesting i mean obviously we need to be careful around that nesting behavior which i'm sure we'll get into but where you know what are their characteristics how can we well, pick you um, know we know that's a swift yeah, because people mainly notice them when they're flying low around buildings screaming in little parties these are called you know screaming parties um and quite often that will be the non-breeding birds they don't, they don't breed until they're about three four years old um, and they, yeah, it's, it's a social behavior. It's connecting with, with each other. Um, so people tend to see that. So they're, they look like they're quite large brownish birds. Um, I mean, they've got quite a long wing, wingspan, about 40, 45 centimeters, but they're only about, I think, 18 centimeters long. They've got these huge, long, um, scythe shaped wings. Um, but it's the scream that, you know, people mainly, uh, notice them by. But they only tend to do that in the, well, mainly in the mornings or, or the evenings is more likely, sometimes during the, during the day, but most of the time they're, they're feeding during the day and they can feed up quite high so people don't notice them. Um, in, in bad weather, they can disappear for days as well, or even in cloudy weather like today, um, you don't see them as much and people say, oh, my swifts have gone, have they left already? But they're off feeding somewhere and they can go vast distances to feed as well. What should, uh, you know, so we hear that call when we're looking in the sky. I mean, you know, I remember specifically vividly there was a a brief part of Spring Watch this year where they did cover swifts and there was this quite animated, hopefully not painful, but quite animated uh, shot where a swift was flying looking for a kind of hole in, I think it was a slate roof or equivalent. Um, why do they choose to nest, uh, you know, in, 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 a, in a slate roof specifically? And, you know, we've talked a little bit about boxes. I mean, for, is that where why is that one of the reasons why they're potentially in decline because you know are we moving away from the, their natural semi-natural building habitat yeah i mean a long time ago they would have there weren't that many you know before we had buildings i mean firstly these birds have been around for millions of years so they they had to find nest places long before there were human beings on the planet um, so they would once have nested mostly in holes in cliffs and in maybe old woodpecker holes in trees. Um, since we've developed more human architecture, I mean, particularly since Roman times, when they built massive stone buildings and aqueducts, the birds have found it more convenient to move into cracks and crevices in our buildings. So that now perhaps 90, 98% of them will nest in human um, architecture one way or another. Um, and what, what we have found recently is that as we've adapted our new building methods to exclude drafts and to make them more, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're insulated for, for heat and whatever to make them more efficient, that has excluded them because there aren't so many cracks and crevices. So we have had to provide additional um, nest sites for them in the, either in the form of boxes, um, but what we are trying to promote even more now is, is nest bricks, where we literally have hollow bricks and cavities that we can build into a wall for them to, to go into now, yeah. Absolutely, I mean, I, I guess I'm gonna play slightly devil's advocate here though. There would be a, even the most wildlife lover, I guess, would ask, and this is kind of open to either of you uh, to answer: Was is there damage to the building? Is there like is is there a concern there? Is there because I think that could be a concern to people who you know obviously we're looking to potentially be more efficient, especially at the moment with cost of living, etc. Like people are looking to hold in that heat, and in the nicest way possible, it may be a survival of the fittest scenario, but it's like, well, if I've got them nesting, is that going to have a knock on it? Like, is there is that a concern? No, it's not because the obviously an external box isn't impacting the building in any way apart from you know, it's just it's hanging on the outside. They do tend to prefer, however, the cavities in a building. And whereas their traditional nest sites would have been just up in the eaves, they would go just under the roof line into the eaves where there would have been a row of bricks with hollows in them. I mean, the hollow in a brick is called a frog, believe it or not. And they would have laid their eggs just in that hollow because it would stop the eggs rolling about. 
and that would be the ideal spot for them. It's those eaves now that are being blocked, uh, but um, and sometimes for very good reason to keep uh, uh, to keep a house nice and warm and to use less fuel and that sort of thing. But the swift bricks that we've been um, using recently are made out of um, galvanized iron. They meet all the fire regulations for a building. They're actually got their own BS number so that they can be incorporated quite safely into buildings without impacting on its integrity in any way. But it just allows the necessary hollow in the wall for the brick for the swifts to nest. And I, yeah, I think the question about, you know, whether there's any uh, damage done, I mean, generally not. If, if people do have their ears open and they're nesting just on the frog, no, just on the brick, um, you can push insulation right up to that area. So, you know, the building can be insulated. Um, it's not left, you know, the, the birds don't fly around inside the attic. They're not interested in doing that. Um, very occasionally a bird might nest on top of the roofing felt. And then if that roofing felt breaks, yes, there can be an issue around uh, water damage. But that's unusual. That's that's not that's an exception, really. Of course, there's, the, you know, like a, a lot of things, there's going to be an exception to the rule. But, you know, OK, then uh, when people think about them, normally, wrongly, rightly, it's nature, right? Normally they eat something and then potentially they are eaten by something, right? So are they important are they integral to to our kind of animal uh, you know that that hunter they eat something and then it gets eat, potentially they get I, eaten by something are they, yeah, are they integral gonna, or do they sit alongside I'm it change that question around and say well, what do you think about the human species are we integral to the planet no would, would the planet miss us very much and no, i think it would be quite grateful so i i think the question is quite uh anthropocentric if that's the correct word um i, I think every, every species you know, has its place in the whole uh, chain of life. And I think Richard and I are just passionate about Swiss, just, you know, because we like them, you know, it comes down to that. Um, but in terms of relative importance, who can say, really? I don't know. Yeah, no, I, what I would say is that we, we're all part of nature. We are one species on this planet. All the species on this planet are interconnected and rely on each other from fungus under the ground to insects in the soil which help to recycle all of the you know the, the dead plant material and things like that if it wasn't for all these individual species this planet would not keep turning in the way it does and who are, who are we to say that any one species is worth losing um a, apart from anything else they've been around for so much longer than we have perhaps, you know, for 60 million years, that is shortly after the, um, the great extinction of the dinosaurs. So their ancestors would have been around at the same time as T-Rex. Um, there's, there's so much of an older species than virtually any other bird we have in the sky. It, you know, is it, is it our place as human beings, as one very untidy species to just to, to to, to actually do things that would cause their demise. No, it's not. Actually, that's, that's interesting when you say you use the word untidy, because that's another question we, we get asked a lot. Um, if Swiss make a mess. Yeah, maybe um, untidiness is good, sorry. <laughs> what, one of my um, arguments is also, you know, they, well, actually they don't make uh, any mess and they don't poo down buildings or whatever. But uh, my response, I'm a little bit more vociferous in this way than Richard. I will say, well, they don't make as much mess as human beings, because I think we're all aware of the, uh, the sewage issues in the rivers and sea at the moment. You know, I mean, in terms of the mess that we're, and that's just only one of the messes that we're making, you know, uh, top of all the pollution and plastic and whatever. Um, but yeah, come back to Swifts. People sometimes are concerned, you know, if I have a nest box, there's going to be lots of poo underneath. And they don't. They actually, they fly straight in. There's no poo. There's no droppings. Um, any of the droppings inside that the young make, um, the adults tend to eat and the boxes don't need cleaning out. But one, one thing we haven't spoken about is the reasons for decline. And the decline has been quite steep. So the figures I've got here, I'm going to read that between 1995 and 2021, UK breeding numbers decreased by 58%. That's almost 60% mm. uh, with, between 95 and 21. And they're, they're still in decline. And 
it's believed that this is largely due to um, lack of places for them to breed. Um, places are getting blocked up more and more. Um, swifts aren't as attracted to nest boxes as other birds are. They do take time. Um, and time is sort of running out in a way. And there was a big campaign for the last year and a half. A woman called uh, Hannah Bourne Taylor. Um, has, she started a petition uh, for government to try to mandate swift bricks in every new build. So that's making these hollow uh, bricks inside every new build. And she really promoted this. She even walked semi-naked through London, I think, in, in November, wasn't it? Something really, really cold weather. And she got some MPs on her side. And Michael Gove at that time, he was the person responsible for whether it's going to happen or not. And she met him quite a few times with other MPs. And eventually he said, no, no major reason given. Um, the bricks don't cost much, maybe about 30 pounds each, which is nothing for you know development. Um, so nationally, there's been no great move on this happening. But fortunately, actually, I'll go to my other notes so I don't upset either of the councils. So Richard and I are based in the Salisbury area, so in Wiltshire. And we've we've been in talks with you know Wiltshire and, and uh, Salisbury Council over the years. So Wiltshire, they've got a draft local plan at the moment, and they're requiring uh, developers to include a minimum of two integrated bird nest bricks per dwelling. That's what they're saying in their draft plan, which is great. We're really happy. Uh, and Salisbury's neighbourhood plan, which is currently out for public consultation, requires one integrated swift brick per residential unit. So between the two of those, it should be happening in our area, but nationwide, it's still touch and go. We spent a lot of time also, there's a, another couple of members of our team who spent um, hours and hours over the last five or six years uh, scanning, uh, planning uh, applications for various buildings in Salisbury and Wiltshire and asking Wiltshire Council to mandate um, swift bricks as part of the planning conditions. And sometimes that's happened, sometimes not. Um, so. I think in terms of what we've done since about 2018, I think we've put up uh, probably close to 500 nest boxes and we've lost track with the number of swift bricks all over Wiltshire, but it's maybe six, 700 now, which is great. Um, Rich has kept us busy this year. He's got people interested in Downton where he lives. Uh, I think we've put more swift bricks in there than in Salisbury actually. So he's really promoted that. So we're busy, yeah. Partly trying. To... So there definitely, uh, there definitely is stuff that people can yeah. do. I think is the is the key message there. I mean, I think uh, maybe you've answered the question, but is there anything uh, specifically? I mean, in the from a government uh, mandatory point of view, uh, we're in quite a interesting reality at the moment. Uh, obviously, general election is looming, etc. So um, whoever does win Salisbury, whoever that ends up being, um, you know, is a way to write to that individual who becomes our MP and say look this is a I'm a resident and uh, you know I care about this or is it do people necessarily you know they need to maybe look at the box element because I think unless you are a developer unless you are someone who you know is building or has contacts in that industry it's going to be quite potentially difficult for the you know the the brick the swift bricks to be put in because obviously that happens to, that has to happen in the build side no, right I mean, so we, we have the, the, the bricks we put in are retrofitted so you can actually take out yeah we should have mentioned that you can actually take out uh, existing bricks and slot in bricks we actually have you know we take a photograph beforehand so the manufacturer makes them more or less the same color so all you notice in the side of the building is a tiny little hole um because that's what I was gonna. Because that's what I was gonna ask you. I was gonna ask you because I think a lot of people who potentially are, li are listening to this episode or or you know consuming this piece of content, they might be like, I want to do something because clearly you know these animals need our needs our help and needs yeah. uh, needs us the, to help them in the some way. One thing actually, I always say is leave them alone. You know, if they if they are nesting somewhere, that's where they want to nest. And when nests are blocked up, they're very they're very loyal to those sites. So they're going to fly away. These birds are going to be in Africa for you know eight nine months. All the time, their little brain has this memory of where that exact spot was that they nested the year before, and they'll come back to that spot. And if it's blocked up, they'll spend hours and days trying to get into a hole that no longer exists, and they won't breed that year. So I think sometimes people are uh, 
naive or they just don't know that if they think, you know, if I block that nest up, it will go somewhere else. First of all, there aren't many other places because most other holes have been blocked up. And also that swift is um, fixated on that particular GPS in its brain. It just knows that particular spot. Um, so it's quite sad seeing them banging away, trying to get into that, that spot. Um, so yeah, the, the primary thing is please don't block up the nest sites, you know, if you don't need to. Um, and then yes, writing to MPs uh, is always worthwhile doing them. The more letters or emails they get, that will be great. Um, but people can put up nest boxes or they can retrofit uh, swift bricks. And the way to attract them to those boxes or bricks, because quite often, you know, they, they won't come. If, they, if, they're, if they're not nesting in the area, you do need to actually play a call system. So that's the sound of a, a screaming swift. Um, you don't need to play it at full volume, but uh, only for about three hours in the morning, three hours in the evening. And they are attracted. They're, they're colonial birds. They will be looking for where other swifts are nesting. And we can fool them into thinking there's a nest in that brick or box. And they'll come and take a look and they, they will nest. Sometimes, I mean, sometimes within two weeks. Sometimes it might take five years or anywhere in between. Yeah. I don't know if Richard had, any, Richard had any, anything to add. Well, um, well, yeah, just that. Um, we, we've, met, we've been lucky enough to actually start a new colony on our house um, back in 2018. And we'd ha had a, a, a nest box up for a couple of years, but started playing some calls and had a bit of interest over the garden. And then during the COVID times, uh, uh, it seemed like a good idea to go and put some bits of plywood together in the garage as a COVID project and put another box up. We hadn't had any interest in the boxes we had up already, apart from them just flying past. But I put one up on the back on the back gable of our house, a different position. And the next year, we were lucky enough to get a, a pair in. Uh, and then since then, I've put in bricks, uh, uh, swift bricks either side of that, as Daniel explained, retrofitted. Mine were, were slightly different in that they weren't just a hollow brick. They were actually the entrance to a little tunnel that went through into my loft space where I put wooden boxes. That way they could be a little bit larger and have cameras in. So I've got cameras in all of my um, swift boxes, whether they're external or internal. And um, those bricks were all occupied within the first year. So um, last year we had, yeah, we had five pairs, only three of them bred, two of the pairs were just trying things out hopefully they'll be back later this year and as we speak right now the same three pairs that we had last year are back again raising families so we've got uh, we've got three little chicks now and another five eggs being incubated so yeah by by starting from nothing um, we've now got effectively a new colony and trying to encourage that with neighbors round and about so the swifts are not just screaming past our house they're screaming past a lot of houses in the area um, some of which have also been encouraged to play calls and put swift bricks in so hopefully it will extend the, the, the greater colony yeah that's no, great it's it, i mean yeah we, we've been saying you know why swifts well they depend on our houses to nest um, they don't really nest many other places uh, also they rely they're they're, they're quite um confiding in us they're not that um, scared of people they don't mind our noises we put up boxes in church bell towers for instance and they'll be quite happy to sit there with the bells clanging away right beside them or they'll nest over teenagers teenagers bedrooms with all their drum kits and everything else going on downstairs they don't care at all and if if by chance one of them needs help and falls to the ground because of some unfortunate uh, accident or it's just uh, exhausted if you pick one up in your hand they're quite happy to be helped they're not going to struggle they'll they'll they 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 almost uh, trust us so there is this there is this um closeness between us and swifts in a way that you don't really see with with other species so they're an iconic bird and they're also a window into nature really for people they're one bird that's that we can help and by learning about them we learn about lots of other birds as well so i think there's lots of reasons for for looking out for them
And I, th I think what's interesting also, sometimes people say, well, isn't, isn't it a problem that uh, there are lack of insects? Um, mm -hmm. Is this what's you know, driving the decline in swifts? Um, possibly in some areas, but as you can see, you know, if Richard puts boxes up and in his house, you know, he creates a colony, so there was no lack of insects there for them. There's lack of nesting spaces, and this has just increased the population of swifts in the village. And this has happened over and over again all over the country. People have increased the number by increasing the nesting spaces. Um, and swifts also will go a long distance to, to feed, uh, so it's not a problem. And they can cover a huge amount of sky. And there are insects up, up in the sky. There's a lot of little aerial uh, plankton of spiders and aphids and things floating around. Um, so it really is the, the nesting issue that we consider to be the, the, major, the major problem. Yeah, uh, that's what I was going to ask you. I mean, because uh, obviously they eat, they eat something, so it sounds like, you know, small insects, etc. cetera, but it, are they eaten by something as well then in the, in the same, same side? Yeah, they are. I mean, all, all, everything gets eaten by something else, unless you really are top of the, uh, top of the ladder. So um, they're very fast. They're actually the fastest bird in level flight. They can outfly peregrine in level flight. Um, they can do around about, 69 miles an hour whereas a peregrine is more like 68 unless a peregrine dives out the sky onto it and then it can go much faster but um they're once they're up in the sky they're they're in in a safe space as far as they're concerned but when they're nesting they're very vulnerable to um things like uh, sparrowhawks or whatever ambush predators or indeed peregrines and in particular hobby hawks that will will um, attack swifts by diving on top of them um, but their survival rates once they've reached maturity are actually pretty good compared to a lot of other birds i mean if you compare them to garden birds like robins or blue tits where you know they, they, they their survival rates are much much lower um, swift some of them will die on migration though the majority of them manage to get back unless there's been sometimes a major weather event particularly things like sandstorms rather than rainstorms which they're more familiar with um, which can cause uh, a, a lot of swifts maybe to die all at once and there have been instances i know in in Europe, where we've seen a lot of dead birds on the ground due to extreme weather events, um, but generally speaking, they once they're up and flying, they're pretty well quicker than anything else. But it's this ambush as they come in and out of a nest. Once a little head pokes out of a nest, a sparrowhawk can get very adept at sitting in a nearby um, hedge. And just grabbing it as it comes out and we we do see that and particularly once the hawk can see that there's a, a colony there it can stay and try and pick off more and more birds which can be very distressing yeah okay uh, i mean uh, this is here but i mean i uh, i know that you guys obviously do talks you do walks etc i mean how do people well firstly how do we find information about that etc but also what what does what is the objective from your guys's perspective for those events because i think it's important obviously we've talked a lot here about them as a uh, as a species and you know potentially what people can do but is it is it just the is it just the you know the magnificence of them etc i mean what's the what it, where did the story come from about behind doing these events where did the actual ideas come from and why why do you do them as a whole is it just that educational yeah, piece? i mean it's partly yeah, the education just let people know well these exist and you know we are responsible for them all of us um not just our group but uh, as a society and well richard and i we gave a little walk and talk last night uh, in Salisbury and you see people getting more and more fascinated the more we talk about them um, and people just enjoying their behavior they're incredible they're incredible birds to watch um, they're, they're thrilling and um, yeah I mean another bit of information that uh, you know we tell people that um, actually Richard had left by this time because uh, he left a bit early and um, I mentioned the fact because I showed um, a live stream from one of my nest boxes and the adults went in there and there was just a, 
an egg sitting by itself and people say well won't, won't, it, won't it just die and i said well this is the, this is one of the amazing thing about swiss as well that both the eggs and also the young can survive a lot of time being left alone um the young i think even about four days can go without being fed um at certain stages in their development uh so this is this is an, you know one amazing fact that most young most small birds would die within a few hours but the young swifts go into a state of torpor and their heart beats a few times a minute and they can survive until the adults come back if the adults have to go away for this bad weather but coming back to the walks and talks yeah it is about enjoying the swifts sharing what we love about them discussing them with people um and yeah if people want to know more about those and about us our website is salisbury and wilton swifts.org and there's all information about the walks and talks so this year we're doing one more in salisbury another one in downton another one in wilton so the dates are on the website um and we've also got a concert a fundraising concert and that's in salisbury in serum college in the cathedral close and that's on uh friday the 19th of uh july and that's yeah that's with the three classical musicians so if people want to come along for that and also watch the Swifts because that is also the, the site of the biggest uh, Swift colony in Salisbury, so that's Serum College in the close. Um, but yeah, all details are on our website, Salisbury and org. Fantastic. Anything you would like to add uh, regarding your event, Sir Richard? Um, yeah, I think by, by walking together with people and watching the birds in the sky and watching the sorts of places that they nest or um, and watching their social behaviour um, is is a very easy way to engage with people. It, it takes a fairly hard-hearted person not to appreciate them once they actually spot them in the sky. Um, sometimes people don't know they're there unless we point them out to them. They move around very, very quickly. Um, and people who do realise they're there don't realise they're in such steep decline. Uh, as Daniel was saying, we've lost pretty well 60% in 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 25 years and we're still losing them according to the bto at a rate of five percent per annum if we don't engage and try to make sure that they keep their homes in our buildings that they rely on we could lose them altogether from our summer skies in another 20 years or so and that would be well i i, I can't imagine that you know to have the next generation of people not to be able to enjoy these wonderful birds yeah are they I mean just something that jumped to mind before before we finish? I mean, are they similar in respect to the family of um in regards to like House Martins and, and Sam Martins as well or not? No, they they diverged from other birds a very long time ago. And all the other birds we have in the sky in this country um branched out from the evolutionary tree a lot later. The only relatives to Swifts now are hummingbirds in the Americas, basically. Um, there are a lot of species, there are 150 odd species of swifts in the world around various, so they, they do have relatives, um, but um, no, they, the, the, they do feed in a similar way, as you say, to swallows and house martins, generally feeding higher than the others, so, you know, they, the swallows will be generally feeding at a lower altitude to the swifts, and the house martins probably even lower than that. Mostly, but I mean, obviously, the swifts can can come down to to low altitudes, and indeed, they'll skim rivers and ponds to drink if necessary. Mostly, they just drink from droplets of water in the sky. But that is just purely convergent evolution. It's just that this method of feeding has been beneficial to species that have evolved completely separately and have just evolved to do the same sort of thing because there is. Um, um, a resource of food uh, in the sky that they can eat yeah fantastic is there any uh and this is kind of to both of you uh, is there any final thoughts anything that you would like to say to to those who are still with us uh, listening to this episode you know if you could leave them with a final a final thought a final process uh, before we end I would, off i would say you know you've only got another what, month well maybe two months uh to go out and watch the swift so yeah do it there's there's if people are watching in other areas apart from salisbury there are more than a hundred groups um over the country now and there's something called swift awareness week which the rspb also um promotes and i think on their website or definitely on their social media they've got a list of all the um 
uh, events happening in Swift Awareness Week, um, which is in July. So people can try and find walks and talks and other events near them. But yeah, go out and enjoy um, the Swifts. If you haven't got a local group, create one. You know, do what we're doing. Yeah. Yeah, I, no, I quite agree. And um, yeah, they're only here for a short time, so we need to enjoy them while we are. Um, but basically, I would just say, you know, look up to the skies before it's too late. Um, notice what's around you generally, whether it's swifts or butterflies or whatever in nature. Learn to appreciate that we are part of a much bigger picture. And without that wonderful um, nature all about us, we wouldn't we wouldn't be able to live. I mean, we've heard stories about pollinating insects and all this sort of thing. If we lose bees, if we lose this, that and the other, the whole of the ecosystem starts to collapse. And um, those birds are just as important part of this ecosystem as 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 the rest of them. They eat an awful lot of um, mosquitoes, for instance, pests, the people that you know, insects that people would consider to be pests. Carry and um, yeah, just one more thing. So if people are interested in the in the bigger picture, I'd like to give a plug for something outside of Swiss, if I may. And I, Carlton, I don't know if you're aware of this, and whether you want to come up to London with me on the 22nd. Oh, I'm not the only person there. On the 22nd of July, you'll also be there with Chris Packham and over 100 other organisations. There's a march called Restore Nature Now. Uh, so you can look that up, uh, website, Restore Nature Now. And there's going to be hopefully tens of thousands of people marching to demand from our future government that we restore nature, um, birds, bees, whatever. Uh, so, yeah, come up. That's on in London on the 22nd of July. If people can make that. Um, I'll be there on the 947 from Salisbury, to Waterloo. <laughs> Join me and others. Yeah. Well, no, but thank you so much for for letting us um, share our enthusiasm. Um, some people might call it something else but <laughs> it's a passion and it's and we yeah we are passionate about these birds as we are passionate about the rest of nature and they are just a window this particular species into what's going on with other species you always mention swallows and house martins they're also in serious decline uh, and so are many other species this country is considered to be um, the poorest in terms of its uh, biodiversity in the whole of Europe and it's not something to be proud of partly it's because we're in a, a fairly um, highly populated densely populated island uh, which we farm intensively and you know land is is precious but we're doing it at the expense of a lot of other things and we do need to look after the place that we live in yep Hello, my friends. Thank you ever so much for joining me once again. If you did enjoy this episode and would not like to miss the next wildlife conversation, business conversation, video production conversation, video marketing conversation, or whatever just uh, you know fires me up and gets me really, really passionate, uh, that's how I'm moving forward with content at the moment. If you uh, are finding similar interest in that I am, then why not subscribe? You can always take it back if you uh, feel the content is not for you or it's going in a direction that maybe not be for you. Thank you ever so much for joining me once again, and I'll see you very very soon.